My name is John LaBelle. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. You can find out more about me at johnlabelle.com. You can reach me at johnlabelle at macmac.com. This is a recording of a lecture I gave in February 2014 for a course on Frank Lloyd Wright. This lecture covers Wright's early houses and how they represent his interpretation of and participation in the creation of the 20th century. We've done an overview. We have a sense of the scope of Wright's work. And now we're going to focus on the early houses. And toward the end, we're going to look at some houses. And then we're going to talk about what they mean, why he did what he did. Somebody brought that up. I need an observe that a lot of the work that Frank Lloyd Wright did get was houses. Here's Frank Lloyd Wright. We looked at his dates, 1867 and 1959. We identify him with organic architecture, and we have at least three meanings for it. We'll go into this in some detail later in the course. Use of natural materials and relating to natural features of the site. What's the problem with this definition? All materials are natural. <laughs> so, well, brick is more natural than steel. Well, you got to put brick in a kiln, you know, just the way you got to put steel, iron in a steel mill. So, uh, but we sort of know what we mean. It's integrated architecture, which is modern architecture. The aesthetic comes from the functions and the materials and the spaces and an architecture of essences. So we'll go into, so we, we touched on that briefly last week. We'll go into that in more detail as we go along in the course. So, one of the earlier works by Wright is a windmill on family property, 1896, Romeo and Juliet. And we see here an erotic analogy with this form penetrating that form. But we also see that it's folded plate construction rather than um, columns which then have sheathing on them, the sheathing becomes the structure. And we'll talk about that more when we get to Wright's high-rise buildings. Now, early in his career, Wright is doing, well, here he is, living in the suburbs, eventually six kids, very expensive habits, always in trouble financially, the client wants a neoclassical house, the client gets a neoclassical house. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright before he becomes Frank Lloyd Wright, we could say. And you can look at architects and see if you see that. Um, unless he's very good at editing. Richard Meyer's first house was a Smith house, and it, his whole aesthetic is right there in the first project. It's very white, sort of early modernist uh, aesthetic. But Wright took a little bit of evolution to get there. Here is the Nathan G. Moore house. Client wants a, a Victorian house. The client gets a Victorian house. So unless you're a real expert, you might, you wouldn't, you know, somebody showed you this, you wouldn't identify it as a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Maybe some experts would see hints in there. I don't. Um, doesn't look like a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And then here is his house for himself in Oak Park, Illinois. Now, we have to accept this as fully Frank Lloyd Wright. This is his own house for himself, but it's still early. He's still 12 years away from formulating his prairie style, which we'll see in a minute. And where does this come from? It comes from the shingle style. Here is Bruce Price in Tuxedo, New York, a series of houses in the shingle style. Doesn't matter what this one is. But first of all, it's called shingle style because they're shingles. This is, all, this, this is Frank Lloyd Wright, both of these. And this is Bruce Price. It has shingles on the side as well as on the roof. But look here, we've got a Palladian window in Bruce Price. We've got a Palladian window in Frank Lloyd Wright. 
We've got two bays in Bruce Price. We've got two bays in Frank Lloyd Wright. So it's pretty, a very steep pitched roof, very close. Now, just a little, I'll, I'll drop in some Frank Lloyd Wright anecdotes occasionally. And the one here is sort of the expert on shingle style architecture is Vincent Scully. And I still have to remember to get you his, his Xerox of his uh, essay on Frank Lloyd Wright. And Scully is a very famous professor of architectural history at Yale. And when Wright came to lecture at Yale, Scully says to Wright, what about the influence of the shingle style on your early houses? And Wright says, son, architecture began when I started putting those houses out on the prairie. In other words, historians like to talk about influence. Architects like to think the world began with them. <laughs> yeah. So Wright's not going to help you uh, uh, speculate about influences on him. So here's the house, very handsome, but certainly not what we associate with Franklin Wright. Now, let's back up. We come around this corner, this is the, the main entrance to the house, come around the side, and we get to his office. So eventually, we were just looking here, eventually, come around here, that's where we are here. Here's this octagonal piece, here's the octagonal piece. Eventually, he puts his office in his house, so the office and the house are together. So he'd be working in his office and his kids would figure out how to crawl through attic spaces and shoot spitballs at him while he's uh, working at his desk. He also locates his mother uh, next door, help take care of the six kids. And you can see this thing just keeps expanding. This is, I have a book on all the stages, you know, plans of all the stages of the house. Just uh, incidentally, showing a kind of shoestring nature to architecture. Wright would steal bricks and other material from construction sites on the way home from Chicago to help build his house. And he skipped the footings. He <laughs> just put the bricks on the ground, built up. So when they restored the house about 40 years ago, they had to lift the entire house up, put in footings, and then lower it down again. Cost a fortune, but there was no way it was going to survive if they didn't do that. But he was, uh, you know, he didn't have the money, he did what he had to do to sort of get by at the time. This is the angle nook, which is the seating area around the fireplace. So after dinner, you sit here with the family, reading a book, looking at a picture book. Right over here is the piano. There's no phonographs, no, uh, you had to make your own music. So a lot of people knew how to play pianos. In New York on 57th Street, there's like one left. But 57th Street was the piano street in New York 100 years ago. And it was just showrooms for all the major piano companies. Steinway is still there, which is the most famous piano maker. But um, the rest are long gone. And here's the dining area. He has these high back chairs, which make sort of a room within the room for the family around the table. So very family oriented. Here is uh, a bedroom. This is a Pocahontas mural. And this kind of sloping roof that contains the room, so making it very homey. And then here is the children's playroom where uh, they've got a mural of Aladdin and the genie and a piano and a balcony. And so it was a real active family life. And here's the office. So inside the office, see, it's kind of heavy and a lot of wood by our taste today, but you can sort of see that we've got um, kind of a crisp geometric quality. You know, very geometric and put together. Can somebody dim the lights a touch more and it will get, it will get better, better visibility. That's great. We can see the slide better now. See this kind of 
crisp geometry showing us how it's constructed. This is the library to the office, client meeting room. Here's another early house. This is, so Frank Lloyd Wright is working for Louis Sullivan. We spoke about that the past two weeks. And he starts doing houses on his own, which is a no-no. You get a commission, you're supposed to bring it into the office. But he's working on them at night. They're called the bootleg houses. Sullivan finds out about it and fires it. It's very tragic because they were very close. Wright called Sullivan his Liebermeister, dear master. Remember, most architects didn't go to school in those days, so the person's office you're working in is sort of your teacher. But after leaving Sullivan, this is the first house that Wright does on his own, the Winslow house. And it's still looking quite neoclassical, symmetrical, but we see a kind of low sloped overhanging roof. And he's putting the second story windows in shadow from the overhanging roof so that even though it's a two story building, it's sort of looking like a one story building. And emphasizing horizontality, which is a key characteristic of the Perry style. <clears throat> Remember we talked about this is where your horses come in leading back to the stables in the back. And in the back, if we look at it from the back here, it's asymmetrical. Big chimney core, asymmetrical, starting to have elements that we're going to see in Wright's mature work. Here's a plan not as symmetrical inside as the outside implies. Here we are around back. Again, in Ingle Nook, we come in, fireplace is hidden right here, seating on the other side, a classical colonnade. Franklin Wright goes to Holland to produce a publication of his works called the Wasmuth Folio. Now today, <laughs> just upload your images to the internet and you're done. Or even 50 years ago, you could, uh, it was rather easy to get a monograph published of your work. But this is a big deal, very difficult. And he made these drawings for that, very handsome. So we've got a perspective, We've got a fragment of the plan. Uh, we've got some fragments of detailing. Very handsome um, presentation. Again, the back state. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the stables. And it doesn't look in this photograph, but they are symmetrical. And it's interesting just to think, this is the stables. <laughs> this is where you park your horse at the end of the day. This is for a guy who's, one of his last buildings was designed to have atomic powered elevators. Now, what are we looking at here? Correct, who's the architect? Palladio. Correct. So, this is Andrea Palladio's Velo Rotunda. And we're gonna, contrast this against Frank Lloyd Wright. So now we're getting to Frank Lloyd Wright's Perry style and his mature work and the defining qualities of his work. And what we're gonna see here is going to be true of his work for the rest of his career. The Villa Rotunda represents humanism. Now, very crude terms, we can say there's three things. There's God, man, and nature. In what is the order of those? And in the biblical tradition, there's God, and then man, or human beings, and God gives man domain over the animals to name them, and they are for his use. So, 
God, in a, in a metaphysical hierarchy, God comes first, then comes man, then comes nature. Now, there's one other element in there. It's not really important to our discussion. What, what else is in there that I skipped? What's between God and man? The angels. <laughs> you know, they're sort of halfway between God and man. But anyway, we're not going to go into that. Uh, so, but in the humanist tradition, the human being is the highest and most central thing. Man knows nature through himself, through observation with the senses and theorizing with the mind. So you know nature through, you watch the apple fall, you think about it, and you come up with the law, Newton's law of gravity. So man is the highest, knows nature. And you observe that every different culture has a different God. That's because God is a function of the human imagination. So man is even superior to God. God is a function of the human imagination. And so that's humanism. So that's what Palladio is doing here. The dome, which had been an earlier architecture, a dome of heaven, now marks the spot where the human being stands. So the human being is central. And it gives a reference point. The way you know the world is through measurement, but measurement needs a point of reference. If I say you are twice as far away from me as you, and therefore half as big in my perspective painting, I have to know where I am. I have to have a place to stand to then make a perspective painting in art or to measure in science. This marks <coughs> excuse me, the place where you stand. The center of your x, y, x, y axis in the Cartesian grid. x, y, z if you include the dome. So this places the human being in the center. Frank Lloyd Wright puts the fireplace in the center. We, are, we cannot occupy the center. You see, there's an implied consciousness here of Palladio. This is sort of a crucifix. But the center is not available for us to occupy. The chimney core is in the center. Chimney core and typically stairs are in the center. And we now meander around that along with nature. So in a Copernican revolution, Copernicus took us out of the center of the solar system and put the sun in the center and said, we're, we're, the Earth is just one more planet going around the sun. Franklin Wright is taking us out of the center and making us meander around the center and meander you know, very irregularly. And there's this interpenetration inside and outside. So we could be outside, we could be inside to sort of flow together. But we are now part of nature. Now, let's look at, we looked at a biblical tradition with God coming first. We looked at uh, a humanist tradition with the human being as the center, most important thing. Let's look at an Asian or Japanese position. The human being is a natural creature. Spirit is in all things including human beings. So God, man, and nature are not three separate things. They're one integral thing. That's Franklin Wright's position. And we're going to go into that in some detail for the end of the course. So we have seen all the material, and now let's see what Franklin Wright was doing. So we'll mention as we go along, but we'll look at it in some detail later. He's taking neither the biblical nor the humanist position but implying a, an organic position, but we could call it, we, we see that in Asian architecture. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright also brings us the open plan, and we'll talk about that in some detail. But in the open plan, 
spaces flow one to another. So here we are again back with Bruce Price. The Kent House, also in that complex in New York. Looks very similar to Frank Lloyd Wright. But there's a key difference. Frank Lloyd Wright liked to refer to destroying the box. So when different members of the family, the father, the mother, the children, each had a different role, a different identity, then we had a room for each one. Now everybody just sort of hangs out together. And so we don't have rooms. We have continuous flowing space. Now, what makes a box? The key thing that makes a box is the corner. So if you were to do this. Obviously, this is a box. But if I just do this, ninety percent of it's gone. But you still perceive a box. Corners do it. If I do this, it's ninety percent still there. But I eliminated the corners. I don't see a box anymore. It gets lost here. Bing, bing, bing. You know, this tells me if I'm walking along here, the corner is going to change my direction. But if I'm walking along here, I just leap right out. Once you take away the corners, you have destroyed the box. Frank Lloyd Wright has set for himself and articulates that his task is he wants to destroy the box because the box means limited, constrained, defined role. And he is proposing an open flow everywhere. A flow between inside and outside. A flow between self and nature. A flow in the sense that I am not defined. My potential is unlimited. I am not born in a caste. In a medieval, okay, your father, your parents were bakers, you're going to be a baker. Your parents were masons, you're going to be. How many people here, one of your parents was an architect? Sometimes I get one, you know. It's like, nobody. <laughs> How did you decide to be an architect? It was through the availability to you of this discovering who you are and manifesting it rather than it being prescribed and given by your family, your caste, your clan, your social position, whatever. This is America. America is a place of opportunity, open and free for each individual to develop a unique self for themselves. So, that entire philosophical position I just presented, Franklin Wright achieves by eliminating that. That's the difference. There's a pretty big opening here. But that little return makes this a box and this a box. Franklin Wright eliminates that little return and one flows into the other. Now, there's also a return here to define the inside versus the outside. Wright puts his door right in this corner so that, remember I showed how without the corner you just go right out? He puts it, he could have, if he had set it in a foot, then he would have had a corner. He puts it right in the corner so that even if you're not walking, your eye, your mind, your sensibility flows from inside to outside. 
It's a sense of continuous flow. So, in traditional architecture, we have each function with a room defined by a box in the open plan. One space flows into another. There is an ambiguity of the transition between the two. Also, with this traditional layout, we tend to, from this room, we can see a lot of the other room. It's known to us. Here, we see very little of the other room. It unfolds as we move. We don't know what, how your life is going to work out. You didn't know, probably, 10 years ago, you are going to be in architecture school. And you don't know that 10 years from now you're going to be designing websites, you know. <laughs> There's no work in architecture. Who knows? This is this totally open, fluid situation. And Wright is symbolizing that with the open plan. Now, there's one other source of the open plan. Here is Catherine Beecher, a very prominent family. Father's a famous preacher and essayist. And her sister is Harriet Beecher Stowe. What did she do? Anybody? How many people have heard of the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin? It was a novel about slavery, and it was in important in instigating the Civil War, the objection to slavery. And her sister is Catherine Beecher. And Catherine Beecher publishes a plan for what she calls the American Woman's Home. And she is proposing that just as Men who are working in factories are benefiting from industrial efficiency. That industrial efficiency should be applied to the work of the homemaker as well. And the study of that is called, anybody? Home economics. So they used to, in high school, they used to have a, but the, the boy students would take shop, the girls would take home ec learn how to fold socks and make jello. Uh, they don't do that anymore, but the idea was that uh, women would master the same principles of industrial efficiency for running the home that the men were mastering in the factory. Now, what do we have in this home? Well, first of all, she's got a tight core that on the basement level, we've got the laundry, the furnace, we go up to the first level, we've got um, Franklin stoves, we've got our kitchen, and we go up to the top level, again we've got our uh, Franklin stoves, we've got front, the chimney core from the furnace going all the way through the house. Now, <clears throat> no fireplaces, fireplaces pull in the cold air from under the door and send it send the warm air right up the chimney. Instead, you have a Franklin stove, invented by Benjamin Franklin, so you have an iron box, the fire's in there. It's not sucking the warm air out of the room, it radiates, the iron gets hot, radiates into the room. But you don't want to pull cold air from under the door, which will provide a draft. The children are playing on the floor, so she provides these ducts up there, to bring in the fresh air up there where it won't create a draft. So it's all worked out in terms of the mechanical, the laundry, the kitchen. It's, it's a machine for living. It's a phrase which we associate with Le Corbusier, but here we have it, 1869 by Catherine Beecher. Now, she invents the modern industrial home is a machine, but she doesn't develop an aesthetic. It has kind of a gingerbread little Victorian house aesthetic. Wright's doing the same thing, uh, but he's giving it a modern aesthetic. One more thing, which I neglected, hang on, that 
We've got this core, and then we just sort of have an open plan around it. She's not defining all these little boxy rooms. She's giving us this open, flexible space around the core. So she's already hinting at this open plan that we are to see in Frank Lloyd Wright. Here we can see uh, more detail, fresh air coming in in this duct above. Here's the stove um, for our kitchen. And so she's got it all worked out. You know, it's very efficient industrial layout here. Okay, so Frank Lloyd, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright takes these principles puts them all together in a style that's called the prairie style. And the first example of the prairie style is the Ward Willett House, 1900-1902. And so here we are 110 years ago. This is looking pretty modern to me <laughs> uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright. So, prairie style. What are the characteristics? Now, the PowerPoints of all my lectures are online uh, in the LMS. So if there's anything you want to grab, you know, like you could take, I don't know how involved you want to get with this stuff, but if you wanted to go get the slides, grab this text, paste them into a Word document, you can do all. These are available, whatever you want to do with them. But we'll take a minute to go through them here. The Prairie style, first of all, it's asymmetrical. So symmetry kind of implies a staticness that Wright wants to break away from. So this has, you know, kind of breaking the symmetry. It's much bigger this way than it is this way, et cetera. Open plan, we spoke about that. One room flowing into another. Destroying the box. The corners are just gone here. It's got a corner here, but not here. I mean, it just breaks down flow from inside to outside. Interpenetration of inside and outside. The walls are just gone. There's a floor to ceiling French doors. It's opening up from inside to outside. Massive chimney core. We're going to see that better in the next one. Low sloped overhanging roofs. Big cantilevers. So we have this leading to a Strong feeling of horizontality. Rectilinear interpenetrating planes. So it's as though, if we look at these walls here, we'll see it again better in the next one. It's as though they're sliding past each other. And then horizontality. Again, we've got two-story building, but it's all dark here, so that it emphasizes the one, as it makes it feel like it's one story. And this is even like the prow of a ship, like it's moving horizontally across the prairie, the American movement westward, the um, openness of the society, massive numbers of people moving from farms into cities. Everything's in motion, and opportunities are opening up. There's our plan. A little more boxy on the second floor. Where you, you don't want your bedroom flowing into someone else's bedroom. This was for sale some years ago. I looked into you know, getting together some investors to buy it. But. Now, particularly when we go around to the back, we see this kind of rectilinear interpenetrating geometries. Now, as we're moving into the field of modern architecture, we know right away that we do not want to imitate the past. We don't want to make a little pantheon, a little parthenon, a Gothic church. So we take away the columns, we take away the pointed arches. Okay, that's what you don't do. What do you do? You can very easily end up with a plain box by you know, taking away all the 
historical ornamental detail. And Europeans were in that position. They were finding, okay, we're getting rid of historical references, now what? And you find that Walter Gropius and the Bauhaus architects early on are doing German expressionism, kind of weird stuff. They don't, they're flailing around for an aesthetic. What do we do? This gets published in the Wasmuth Folio that I spoke about, 1911. Very, and it's published in Holland. Very quickly, a group of artists that we came to come to be called the Stiel, which means the style, are taking this aesthetic and making modern art out of it. Sculpture, painting, here is Ritveld's project for a house. Here's Ritveld's, um, here's the Ritveld Schroeder house. And these very abstract geometric planes become the new aesthetic. And they are taken as symbolic of industrialization. Now, you know, yeah, I guess so. You know, machines would tend to make uh, sheetrock or plywood or, you know, planar surfaces as opposed to carved ornate stuff. And then you start playing with these planar surfaces and that becomes the aesthetic of modern architecture. So you look at Mies and Corbu and Gropius, it all comes from right here. This is, this is where they got it. Then these, dis the balance is still floundering around without an aesthetic. They have a philosophy of confronting the industrial machine world, but they have no aesthetic. These de Stiel artists go to the Bauhaus to give a lecture, and the Bauhaus people say, wow, this is it. This, and that, this then becomes modern, arch modern European architecture. All comes from Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. Here it is, Mies van der Rohe's project for a brick country house. Interpenetrate. Now, if we had the original drawings, we see that there's glass here and here. So these are interior spaces with glass walls. And then these brick walls go from inside to outside, engaging the landscape. So we have interpenetration of inside and outside. We have de destroying the box. We have the open plan. We have this abstract geometric geometry in Mises' early work. Where are we going to see this again in Mises, very famously? All this stuff I just Barcelona. Correct. So Barcelona Pavilion is just Frank Lloyd Wright done in glass and steel rather than in brick and wood. And so here is this stuff leading to Mondrian, abstract painting, and to Mies. All comes from Frank Lloyd Wright, this period. Now this is the most famous prairie style house, the Roby House. Chicago, 1909. So let's go through our list. We've got a wall of floor to ceiling glass doors, French doors out onto a balcony. So interpenetration of inside and outside. Low sloped, overhanging roof. This is not flat. It has a slope, just like you can see here, but uh, we're too low to see it. Interpenetrating planes, a kind of asymmetrical pinwheeling effect pinned down by a massive chimney core. So it's symbolic of the motion of this emerging industrial life, change, people moving about, but you can come home to this secure hearth in this, with this massive chimney core. Here's our plan. This is a drawing he makes for the Wasmuth folio. Here's ground floor. We come in, we go all the way around and come in here, hidden entrance, come up the stairs integrated with the fireplace chimney core. And if we go through the house like this, it's a totally different experience than if we go like this. In other words, there is no house. 
There's the house that we experience by taking a certain path. Take a different path, you get a different experience. In the, bar, in the, in the Villa Rotunda, you see one corner, you've seen the whole thing because it's bilaterally symmetrical all the way around. You know what's there, even though you can, cannot see the whole thing at the same time. In these houses, it unfolds depending upon your motion through it. You generate what happens, as in quantum physics, which we'll see shortly. Here's the prow, pointed prow here, as we're gonna move through here and here move across the prairie. Here's our whole wall disappears for these French doors and the penetration inside and outside. One more thing. Look at all that's going on here. Okay, there's lots of busyness. I could say, I'm going to throw around a bunch of planes. I'm going to throw around some forms to get it to be interesting. Wright wants to deny that. He says, these forms are not arbitrary. They are generated by the plan. So he draws the plan next to the perspective so that we can see how these forms grow out of the plan, go out of the spaces of the building. They're not applied just to make it interesting. Now, there's something a little bit off here. Can anybody guess what it is? These don't quite line up, why? This is a plan, this is a perspective. Now, if you had a plan and an elevation, then you'd get an exact correspondence. But, a few years later, he puts the plan in perspective. So it exactly he can keep this a perspective, make the plan a perspective, and then they line up. How do you make a plan a perspective? Just like this. Here's the plan, and if I go like this, you now see it in perspective. So he tilts the plan so that it's exactly corresponding to the elevation. We'll see that in a few weeks. We revert to these black and white photographs because this is right next to the campus University of Chicago, and they put up some buildings in the background. I don't know why someone just doesn't Photoshop them out, but. <laughs> so Roby was a bicycle manufacturer. At this time, interestingly, the bicycle and the automobile came about exactly the same time. And there were dozens of automobile manufacturers, and eventually it settled down to just a handful. We used to say the big three, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. There were a few more. They were, but very quickly, it hundreds became just a few. Same thing with bicycles, and eventually came down to just two: Columbia and Schwinn. And <coughs> Roby was one of the people who went bankrupt, and he had to sell the house. So the family was not in it that long. So you come around here, let's go back. You come, so where's the entrance to this thing? You come around, all the way around, and there's the entrance. Come all the way around, and there's the entrance. This is not the garage, the garage is over here. This is a courtyard here. This is where you get the deliveries of food and coal, et cetera, and the garage. But this is the pedestrian entrance. Now, why does he hide the entrance like that? I'm pretty good at interpreting this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody has a thought, let me know. But the idea, like in the Villa Rotunda, of you know the, the portico, with the pediment and the columns and the entrances in the middle. He's deliberately not doing that. Maybe it's in part to get away from neoclassicism and that obvious central entrance. Like, looking at the Guggenheim, where would you say the entrance is? I mean, you can figure it out when you get there, but it isn't like, aha, there's the entrance. You know, like, when you get to the Metropolitan Museum, 
you don't have to guess where the entrance is. <laughs> if you get to the 42nd Street Library, it's clear where the entrance is. Not with the Guggenheim, not with these houses. Now, I have several times used the term horizontality. So here's the brickwork for the Roby House. A very handsome brick, it's a Roman brick. Who can tell me what distinguishes a Roman brick? Correct. So technologically, it's like any other brick. It's just the shape. It tends to be longer and thinner. And so sometimes you would use it if you want to emphasize horizontality. Now, what two more things does Wright do to emphasize horizontality here? Two things with the mortar. One is, here's the brick. He scoops the mortar out, which you do. You know, I mean, you, you can either make the mortar flush, you can make it bulge, you can scoop it out so it's indented a little. By scooping it out, making it white, and making it thick, it's making these distinct stripes. Now, what's the other thing he does with the mortar? Stains the mortar in the middle. Correct. So the vertical mortar is flush and stained red. Who would freak about that? Certainly Louis Kahn. <laughs> what, what is this? You're painting your bricks? You're painting the mortar, some of the mortar, for a visual effect? So um, Wright just doesn't have a, he doesn't freak about that kind of thing. Uh, and we'll see more examples of that. Inside, this is contemporary furniture, actually about 30 years ago when this slide was made, but it's, so this is not the original furniture. Here we are in the living room. We see these, the wall disappear for these floor to ceiling French doors. He's still using ornament, that'll stop in a few years in the stained glass. The living room flows around and even through the, the chimney core to, was that me or somebody else? My wife has discovered texting. Thanks for renewing your AT&T Navigator service. <laughs> um, so, the living room flows to the dining room. They are not separate boxes. Interesting detailing here. So here we are flowing around or through the chimney core. Okay, so with these ornamental detailings in the ceiling, at each point we've got a globe with a light bulb inside, and right there. And that gives us kind of a, you don't want to have all light be indirect. Even if there's enough, you want spots of, you know, the bulb visible or the globe or shade visible to give a punch to it. Otherwise, it just looks like bland. So this gives you these points of light. Then a lot more light is in these grills here. In these grills, they're wooden grills. Above them is another light bulb giving you indirect light. In addition, under Each window over here, we've got a radiator, so the downdraft is countered by the heat below. We can't have a radiator here because these open and you have to be able to walk out onto the balcony. So below, there's a grate here and a heating pipe here. So the heat comes up to counteract the cold air coming down. These are double glazed. Then, exhaust air goes up through these vents into here and is exhausted out. So, this is a 
uh, machine for living. The lighting and the ventilating are all totally worked out to serve you as the person occupying the space, but without being, totally without your being aware. There's, oh, you know, here's this monster fan in the middle of your living room to tell you that we've got exhaust. No, it should be hidden. You should just be comfortable. Now, when I want to pick on Corbu, I'll uh, contrast this to Corbu's totally inept interiors. Corbu's talking about machine for living. He makes a south wall, two stories of, sol of you know, sealed glass, no opening. <laughs> you just bake in there. And then he's got a light bulb hanging in the center of the ceiling, which burns out to photograph. There's just this blur in the center. He has to draw the light bulb back in with a pencil. You'll see it in his books. Uh, you know, they just knock your eyes out to have a bare light bulb hanging there. It, he has no sense of how to do this stuff. Right 15 years earlier is doing very successfully what Corbu talks about, but is not really able to do. So that's my little put down of Corbu. So here is our detail coming across. Here's our light as a visible fixture. The grill is right here, right here. And looking up, we see the hidden light bulb, giving us indirect lighting into the perimeter of the room. This is a recreation of the original carpet. So this is an abstract plan, it's sort of like the plan of the Roby House, this little abstract design here. So this belongs to the University of Chicago and it's used as a conference center. Here is our stained glass, very abstract. Okay, so any questions about Roby or Word will it? Okay, let's um, let's keep going. It, it, it's got fair. One will take a break. So this is the Coonley House, 1908. Huge, beautiful house. Here is the living room, and there's a sense of like a Frank Lloyd Wright is later to do a church in which it's sort of like hands in prayer containing the congregation. This is sort of like the house containing the family, just this rise to the center of the ceiling makes it a, a kind of contained experience. Kunli is huge, goes on and on, and it's also famous for the out back, the children's playroom. So the these windows from the children's playroom are in the Metropolitan Museum. So we can see them here. Very rich, playful, fun decoration. This is for children. It should be fun. It should be colorful. There's little, there are little tables and there are little chairs to play with, serve tea. <laughs> Puts a little American flags in here. <laughs> Hang on, let me just see how much I have to go, and then we'll figure out when to take a break. Okay, we're going to keep going, and then uh, take a break, and then talk about some other ideas. So this is... Susan Lawrence Dana House. So she became heiress to silver mines, incredibly rich, and she wanted to be a leading hostess in Springfield. So she had to have a house that was the house. And unfortunately, while it had this huge budget, its right did not do it from scratch, its renovations of the house she already had. So the ornament is all very much Frank Lloyd Wright, but some of the planning is something he's stuck with with what's already there. And 
This is second floor. This is first floor. So a lot of horizontality, low roofs. And looking at this plan, we see something interesting. It's filled with these axes. In other words, this looks symmetrical around this axis. But now this is symmetrical around this axis. This is symmetrical around this axis. This is symmetrical around this axis. So I don't know how much of this was right and how much was already there, but we don't see that in his other work. So, um, uh, but the interior is fully is. We've got all these axes. I might have even missed some. Spectacular interior, these rounded ceilings. It's filled with stained glass. Now, the term that's usually used is art glass. And it's, it's leaded colored glass. So you typically call it stained glass. But I think the term at the time was art glass. So these lights, this beautiful um, art glass. The entrance here come in and there's this sort of front. The light comes in from up here, illuminating this entryway. Here are these butterfly or moth motifs. And the color is supposed to be reminiscent of the prairie, the brown grass or wheat fields of the prairie. Here's one of these lamps. Here we are close in here. And then here's one of the windows. These are shafts of wheat. Why am I including the little house here? Anybody? I don't think it's that interesting. Why do I show you the little house? It's here in New York. <laughs> this is, this is the, the living room of the little house is in the Metropolitan Museum. So when you go to the Metropolitan Museum, next time you're there, and you, you know, that place is so big. I, <laughs> it's part of the American wing, I think. But it isn't easy to find. You have to get the map and ask, where's the Frank Lloyd Wright living room? You know, they'll show you on the map. But when the Littles were having their house torn down and selling the property, the Metropolitan Museum bought the whole thing, took it apart, it's all in storage, and they recreated the living room in the museum. Here you can see these sort of ropes out here as you walk by. <laughs> you walk by, you can't go in there. You can sort of go about to here and then look in. Then sort of to wrap up, around this time, it's not a house, but this is the Ahara Boat House. And why do you think I'm showing you this one? What if we see here now for the first time? Concrete. It's concrete and a totally flat roof. You know, it's not, the roof is getting more sloped, you know, not as peak, but no, it's totally flat. So this is a boathouse on, on a river, the University of Wisconsin. The ornament's gone, the, wa the walls are just flat, the roof is totally flat. So, so you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, he still had peak roofs and there's a lot of ornament and you have to get to the 1920s before the Europeans make totally abstract white concrete boxes. No, well, Wright's already done it in 1905. It didn't get built. So, you have the drawings, and here it is. <laughs> they built it a few years ago. But this is built just recently, but exactly to the plans. It's in Buffalo. It's in Buffalo? Yeah, it's just there. Huh, this says Wisconsin. What do I know? <laughs> Email me that reference. Okay. Thanks. And I'll change the slides. Yeah, Buffalo is really getting in on Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I, the, um, um, Martin House. I don't know why I don't have the Martin House in here. We'll, we'll see it again later. You, oh, no, yeah, we're going to look at the Martin House next week. That's in Buffalo. And one of Wright's 
very few office buildings was the Larkin building, but that was torn down in the 1950s. And there's no way they're going to recreate that. <laughs> that is such a, you know, that would be really something to recreate. Now, why am I showing you this? This is the Gale House, 1904. It's another one of these early houses. Um, it's the same layout as Falling Water. So here is our chimney core, our chimney core. We're cantilevering this way, this way, we're coming this way. Lower level, second floor, roof. Lower level, second floor, roof. Um, we'll look at this again when we look at Falling Water. Okay, so one of the things I'm going to try to do in this course is address, what does it all mean? Why did Wright do that? What, you know, okay, you can make an interesting building, put bumps in it, put curves in it, put uh, whatever. And if it's outrageous enough, it'll get in the magazines. But what gets architecture in the history books is the degree to which it is reflective of its time. It's an embodiment of a fundamental idea about its time. Also, it should be good. It should be excellent, well-designed, well-proportioned, whatever. But what makes it important is its reflectiveness of its time. So let's look at what we just looked at in Wright's work and see how we might argue that case. So going back to the Villa Rotunda, and I should put right here, we should have a, a pantheon. <laughs> so imagine there's a pantheon here. And so the Villa Rotunda is a Renaissance building borrowing from Roman architecture. And 1567, here we are, 1941. This is several years after Frank Lloyd Wright does Falling Water. We're building the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. in this Palladian Pantheon style. Now, why are we doing that? And I'm going to posit that the reason is that the architects doing this, of which there were very few in 1941, there were a lot in 1900, were saying that we in America in the early 20th century are a continuation of, descendants of, Greece, Rome, the Renaissance. We are seeing ourselves in that tradition. Now, what is that tradition? It's a certain attitude about the human being, a place in nature, humanism, etc. This is exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright is going to be challenging, denying, asserting something new. So what did Frank Lloyd Wright experience and how, what does he contribute to it? The decentering of the family. When Wright was growing up, the small farm was a place of, well, first of all, going back to the time of the Founding Fathers, there's a, a McCullough does a biography of John Adams and he opens with John Adams heading from Massachusetts to Wash to Philadelphia to work on the Continental Congress, to work on what's to become the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. He leaves behind his, he's a lawyer, he leaves behind his wife to run the farm. So even this lawyer who becomes President of the United States eventually, it has a farm. Everybody had a farm. That's where you got your food. They didn't have grocery stores. So it's only in the 1840s that we begin to see industrialization. When Wright was born, um, he worked on, he lived and worked on his uncle's farm. And in that farm, it was a place of production and consumption. You went out to the workshop, you made a chair, and then you sat on the chair. You slaughtered an animal, you cooked it, you ate it. 
So you did the production and the consumption in one system. By the early 20th century, production had moved to the factory or the office, and the home became purely a place of consumption, otherwise known as the suburban house, as opposed to the small farm. Now, if you go back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, you lived in a suburban neighborhood. If you had a neighbor who had chickens, you were really embarrassed. Like, oh, God, well, people come visit us must think we're hillbillies. You know, we've got this hick down the street with chickens. Uh, and you wanted to <coughs> distance yourself from that. You worked in the factory. The home was purely a place of consumption and display beautiful front lawn. You didn't have goats crazy on your front lawn. It was just there for show. That's the suburban house. Frank Lloyd Wright <coughs> plays a central role in the creation of that suburban house. That's what these houses were that we just saw. Places purely of consumption, no production, there's no you know, workshop out in the back, there's no bailing up the hay in the backyard. Uh, that's separated. So here we have the invention of the modern suburban house, and Frank Lloyd Wright is central to it. The breakdown of rigid roles in the family. So this is actually an illustration from Catherine Beecher's book. But anyway, we go back to the Victorian family, and after dinner, the father goes to the smoking room, the mother goes to the sewing room, the children go to the nursery. There are all these boxes for all these roles that are defined by your place in the family. And we'll talk a bit as we go along about existentialism. There's Dostoevsky is considered a pioneer of existentialism, and he has a book called The Idiot, in which there's this young prince and he's very innocent, you know, and he, he's speaking to the general, and he says, who are you? And the general says, what do you mean? I'm a Russian, a Christian, a general, and a father. <coughs> and the prince says, yeah, but who are you? The guy doesn't know what he means. You know, you are your roles. Well, with existentialism, you're not your roles. You're responsible at every moment to make yourself and continually remake yourself. The open plan is a stage for being able to do that. You don't have boxy rooms that define your roles in the family or in life. But there's this flux. And where do we see that very prominently right now? It, how many people have watched any Modern Family episodes? Anybody? Well, I, you know, I don't watch much of that kind of television. And my brother-in-law says, you got to see this. <laughs> Suddenly I'm addicted, you know. <laughs> that and Big Bang Theory. <clears throat> so, but it's like, these people are all over the place. There's, you know, there's no conventional role here. These, this is the father. This is his gay son who's married to this guy. They've adopted a Vietnamese girl, uh, to a married gay couple with an adopted daughter. This is his daughter. Uh, she's married to, where is he? Thank you. This guy, they've got three kids who are, they're reasonably, this is, this is the conventional 50s family. A mother, a father, they're married, the marriage is intact and they have three kids, you know. But he's divorced from his first wife. Uh, he's married this Latin bombshell uh, who has a kid. They've escaped the drug cartels in Colombia. And they, she, just, she just recently, I don't follow it or know how long ago it was, but she got pregnant, so they're having another kid. Uh, he's pretty old to be having kids. Uh, so it's like they're all over the place. These people need this. You know, you can't put them in boxes. That's not how we experience ourselves anymore. Frank Lloyd Wright 
here in the open plan, is central to the recognition and creation of this new world of people in constant making and remaking of themselves as opposed to living out defined roles. You're going to experience that in, you go back 50 years, 100 years, what you would do when you got out of architecture school would have been pretty standard. Now, it's all over the place. There are people doing performance art. There are people who are doing websites. There are people, nobody has an office anymore. Everybody has a studio. And then they get grants to do. I was blown away when I found out that Diller and Sclafidio began as performance artists. Then they got this billion dollar job to renovate Lincoln Center. <laughs> Where do they have the experience to do that? You know, what have they done? Well, they did some performance pieces, and then they get a billion dollar job to renovate Lincoln Center. That's not how it used to work. <laughs> it's just like all over the place. When Wright was growing up, there was this thing called the Milky Way, or our galaxy. That was it. That was the universe. Now. There were some fuzzy things, and those were thought to be dust clouds that are in the process of forming stars. There were stars in process of formation. In the 1920s, Hubble, first with the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope, and then later with the 200-inch Mount Palomar telescope, discovers, oh my god. Those little fuzzy things are not stars in our galaxy. They are outside of our galaxy, and they are other galaxies, and there are billions of them, probably trillions. And the whole thing's expanding. <laughs> it's like it's flying apart. So it's like, Boy, did the universe change in the 1920s from the one Wright grew up in. So Copernicus, before Copernicus, our Earth was the center of everything. Then he says, OK, you're, the sun's the center. The Earth is just another planet. But you know, our solar system was still the center of everything. Then there's the fixed stars out there around it. Then. So, you know, it, we, we, we're decentered from the center, but we're still pretty close. It's not that far from the Earth to the Sun. At least the Sun's the center. Now, there's millions of stars, and we're just one of them somewhere in this pinwheel. But at least this is our universe. Then, there's billions of these things. And it's flying apart. And now it's really freaked everybody a few years ago. They discovered the rate at which it's flying apart is accelerating. <laughs> and there might be billions of parallel universes on top of that. So, it, you know, this kind of centered, you know, where we knew where we were, you know, we're on Earth. Okay, there's a solar system, but it's pretty, you know, we're pretty near the center of everything. That's gone. When Wright was growing up, we had Newton's laws, laws of motion, and the Newtonian universe based on space, time, and causality, <coughs> made up of matter, energy, and forces. That's it. You can now comprehend and explain everything, space, time, Causality, matter, energy, forces. And you put, you've got formulas for all of them. We're in a stable, the, the universe is a great clock. Tick, 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 everything running according to rules. It's called the clockwork universe. 1905, Einstein publishes Special Relativity. 1915, he publishes general relativity, and it's like the whole thing is come unglued. There is no uniform space. 
each object is generating its own space, distorted space. Space is like collapsing. In the reason this falls is not because the invisible hand of gravity comes out and grabs it. it fall, it's actually staying still. Now I'm pushing it. I can even feel the resistance to my push. Now it's staying still. But the space that it's in is dynamically collapsing into the Earth. The Earth is distorting space. That's what this diagram is meant to show. So it's like totally unglued from what people had spent centuries assuming. We're totally in flux here. There is no center in which to fix ourselves. And as we move through here this way, it's a totally different world if we move through it this way. And then we'll talk a little bit about quantum theory later, and then it really gets weird. OK, we have the loss of a fixed point of view. When Wright was growing up, painting was organized by perspective, establishing a fixed point of view. So in structuring a perspective, the, what's the first question? Well, this, you start with, where am I? And at my eye level is the horizon line. My eye level establishes the horizon line. The vanishing point's going to be along the horizon line, established by me where my eye level is. So it's all organized around me. So even Impressionism, which is starting to get kind of fuzzy, this is a Degas ballet dancer's painting. He does many of those. We can, don't want to touch the painting, but we can uh, get a reproduction of the painting, get a red magic marker, and draw the, the perspective line. So figure out exactly where he is, where all the perspectives vanish. It's a two-point perspective, where the figures are positioned in that perspective. In the around 1910, we get cubism. So the first proto-cubist painting is Picasso's Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. And then Picasso and Brock develop cubism. And it's shattered. The figure is shattered. We are in motion around it. We're seeing it from different points of view at the same time, et cetera. Again, what we experience in the Roby House and Wright's other peristyle houses without a fixed point of view from which we can see it. And so this house is totally different from this house. We have an observer here, an observer here. They're each going to describe very different houses. We have an observer here, an observer here, I got to describe the exact same thing. The loss of a fixed narrative structure. When Wright was growing up, novels were chronological. There was, if you're reading Balzac or, you, or whomever, reading Mark Twain, there is a an observer who is seeing everything and telling it to us. So there is a vantage point from which an observer can see the action and report it to us. In stream of consciousness, it's following what's going on in your head. I'm sitting in this room. I'm listening to this idiot talk. You know what do I have to do later? Am I gonna, am I gonna get my work done? What, tomorrow is design studio. I gotta get out of here, I gotta get back to my work. This is all the stuff going on in your head. The stream of consciousness novel follows that, rather than stand outside and say, well, Lobel is lecturing and the students are sitting, you know, just an independent outside objective observer might see that. We are each, have whole world spinning around in our head while we're presumably supposed to be doing our Frank Lloyd Wright course. So Marcel Proust in Search of Lost Time, James Joyce in Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, Virginia Woolf into the Lighthouse are all following 
the stream of consciousness of their characters as opposed to an objective, independent reality. And again, the experience of this person is totally different from the experience of this person moving through one of Wright's houses. The loss of human centeredness. When Wright was going up, growing up, human beings were the favored children of the creator. Okay, the creator created all of, you know, the, on the, set, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, created this, that, and the other thing, but we're the favorites. <laughs> we get we a special status. Uh, and even if you are not looking from a religious point of view, we have consciousness, we have intelligence, we have rationality, so we're special. Now, Darwin's book, I should know the date, but it's published in the 1860s, so just when Franklin Wright was born. So when Wright was growing up, Darwin was known, but it had not really been Darwinism, had not really been absorbed. But as Wright's life unfolds, the world begins to adopt this Darwinian point of view, and human beings are on their own, just one more animal. We now know we share 90% of, 99% I think actually, of our DNA with chimpanzees, and 20% we share with yeast. <laughs> How special is that? But we can play Jeopardy. However, what's happened five years ago? Right, IBM built something called Watson and it beat the two Jeopardy champions. Uh, so we can't even win Jeopardy. And chess is gone. You know, I mean, the, 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 the world chess champions don't play computers anymore. Finally, when Wright was growing up, there were European empires before World War I that saw themselves as descendants of Rome. The Byzantine Empire was the Eastern Roman Empire. Taken over by Islam, it becomes the Ottoman Empire. That's the Eastern Roman Empire, it's still there. It gets broken up after World War I. Part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These are all seeing themselves as rooted in ancient European culture, descendants of Rome. After the First World War, after you know, 1918, they're shattered, they're all gone. And they're, the architecture of those empires that was rooted in Rome, which gave them their legitimacy, right plays a key role in destroying that neoclassical Rome-based architecture and replacing it with modernism.